In this episode, I talked to Dermot and Peter of Wonder, W-O-N-D-R dot I-O. They're a digital agency. Uh, they believe they have a slightly different philosophy than most digital agencies. Uh, Dermot founded Wonder, I, I believe it was seven years ago, and Peter is the director of product. It was a, a really interesting discussion seeing a number of challenges and successes that Dermot has experienced from founding Wonder. And Peter has some interesting ideas on how he manages uh, multiple products from different clients. I hope you enjoy. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm your host, Dave Albert. In this show, I talk about technology, building a company as a CTO and co-founder, and have guests to discuss their roles in technology and entrepreneurship. Today, we're joined by Dermot O'Shea and Peter Delaney. Dermot is the founder of Wonder, and Peter is the director of product. That's uh, W-O-N-D-R dot I-O. Thanks for joining me, guys. No problem, Dave. Thanks. Uh, Dermot, could you tell us a little bit about yourself and starting Wonder? Wonder, yeah. Uh, I suppose Wonder, we're about to enter our sixth year in business, and... uh, I myself have worked in branding and uh, digital design. I've been around since the days of Flash. Maybe people listening to this, if you're old enough and as ugly enough as I am, uh, you might remember Macromedia Director, Freehand. Oh, yeah. uh, so I started when I was coming up in design. That was the thing we used. Uh, Flash kind of opened my eyes to the way that experiences could be done for the future and not everything had to be in print. So I think... Uh, I started out being inspired like everybody else using the FWA uh, as inspirations for the future of web experiences, getting inspired by people like the North Kingdom, uh, Fancy and other companies that came up of that era that are now the big guys that we all still aspire to be, I suppose. And uh, I'd <clears throat> been through a good run in uh, agencies. I'd worked in uh, a global brand agency called The Brand Union. Uh, specializes in kind of large rebrands. So maybe one certain Irish people might be familiar with is the GA would have rebranded about 08 or 09. And that would have been a project I worked on, ironically, with our creative director who still works with me today here in Wonder, uh, Ashina Hurst. And we rebranded our organization from top to bottom, everything from the sponsorship true to the digital experience, <clears throat> sorry, true to uh, stadium, uh, packaging, the whole shebang, the kit and caboodle. So I suppose even if you're driving into Killarney today or you're going up through Sligo, you're going to see that word, uh, that work embedded even on people's skins as tattoos, uh, everything. So it's completely uh, mixed into the social fabric of Ireland and it's very proud to be able to maybe look back at that work and say you were a small part of it. Uh, from then on, went into... Like bigger agencies wanted to specialize just in digital. I understood which way the world was turning. Uh, for me, uh, once I enjoyed brand, digital is where it was at for me. So I joined a, a larger company, walked through there, worked on lots of, you know, e-commerce projects, lots of large launches, lots of tourism stuff. Some of the stuff people might recognize, work for Falcia, work for Google, all that kind of stuff. The usual stuff that anybody that's worked in a half-decent network agency can come out the other side and say, yeah, I've got projects I'm proud of, they're cool. But I realized that model was broken, or what I would uh, describe, and it's probably st- that language is still around here today, that there's digital transformation happening, or uh, disruption. <laughs> and I, I would say to anybody that's lived through it, There's no such thing as integration. There's only disintegration. So when two companies come together, particularly in advertising, where you have a culture of traditional meets digital, what you end up is a duplication of roles. And that leads to the sorts of tension that disintegrates the culture of the agency. And that was pretty much my experience. So I decided uh, there was no point being in a company that would like to pretend it'll do everything from 
the corporate boardroom strategy true to your ad, true to your radio ad, true to that thing called the digital thing, the digitally, digitally, you know, the thing that goes on the internet, yeah. So I felt we needed to move from being uh, places that treated digital like an inventory fulfillment to something that actually drove a whole organization forward. Most people's first experience of brands today is a digital one. It's not a business card. Uh, so basically that kind of I suppose springboarded, I mean, to thinking I needed to sort out a organization that would be built from the ground up by creative people, uh, no departments, no client services, no focus on revenue, but focus on doing work that you're proud of. And that's how Wonder got started, basically. So Wonder's uh, philosophy is to stay to its niche. And its niche, uh, I would say, is understanding how organizations use digital to actually make their business improve. So we can use all the fluffy language we like. Okay, yeah, of course we're doing digital strategy. Of course we're doing UX design. Of course we're doing UI. We're doing MVP definition. We're doing development. But our core services are companies that come to us that want to start a partnership. A lot of our, uh, if you will, Dave, signature clients uh, have been ex-agency or have been around long enough in the industry. They've seen every circle of truth come back and around, yeah? And what they're looking for is people that know the stuff and there's no layer of, uh, and I don't want to swear on your podcast, we'll keep this very PC, uh, no layer of uh, mystery. <laughs> yeah, but, but shit, yeah. Uh, I, I just tried, in short, I've probably gone on a very long roundabout there to explain whilst maybe previous iterations of agencies might have created complexity because there's money in creating complexity because you get to manage it, yeah. we take away complexity and that's why our whole proposition around clarity and bravery. So clarity is just making sure you actually understand what it is everybody wants. And depending on what your skill set, if you're a UX or UI or a developer, that can mean a different thing. In UX, it's Defining the KPIs and personas, but in a developer is defining the epics, the stories, all the details of the technology. And that's a lot of energy we put into it. The other thing is bravery. Uh, it's interesting to see uh, not many people would use those words. And uh, throughout the career, uh, I suppose leadership always comes from the top. I've always been brave and not frightened to say, this is the wrong way to go. So if a client wants to come to us in the morning and say, I want you to build this thing 5,000 euro, and I don't think it's the right thing for your business. I won't take you 50 grand. I wish you the very best of luck. Yeah. And I might send you on to someone that might like that work and wish you well. Yeah. So we're not, we're not frightened to make brave choices. Sometimes in the middle of the project, say, guys, you really need to trust us and go this way. Cause if you do, we're going to have a percentage uplift in sales or I guarantee you this is going to happen. So that's pretty much, I hope that kind of captures the philosophy maybe of, uh, wonder. Pete, do you want to add? Because that was a, a long rant for me. And, it was uh, a very long story, my friend. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah, we went in a very long way. Sorry, Dave. We yeah, went all the way to America and back with that one. I suppose I'll start off with myself. Um, I started off in, believe it or not, video games, doing graphical HUDs, user interfaces, uh, coding and UX and UI, as we call it now. Yeah, yeah. Back in the day, we were just called developers yeah. <laughs> right? uh, from there one day I was asked to go into do an actual project for the internet and this was new let's just say at the time for especially for this kind of market um, went in there ended up loving it because it was so many different languages it was so many different new tools that I was learning um, from there it kind of spanned out into being a full stack developer and then from that I learned the magical world of product uh, when products started and started to be introduced into an agile environment i just excelled in that kind of front came in here i basically came in here because of the clarity and bravery that Dimmer was talking about uh, where basically we bring everything from the very start with clients all the way through to deployment and believe it or not continuous development uh, with the ethos that clarity we share everything with them, then we make them understand. And then the bravery is we don't bullshit around things. We try to make sure that we don't waste anything and we always do it in the best manner for the actual clients as well. That's me. I'd Thanks. say long short bit honesty. It's a, it is a rare thing. I know people say that honesty doesn't pay in business, but it does. If you do good work, 
uh, more good work will follow and money will work itself out in the end. <clears throat> that's kind of the philosophy that we have. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, just a reminder, try not to bang the table. <laughs> I th- I'll do this if, if, cause it's just, I can hear it. That's the reason. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, let me just make a note of this so I can cut this bit out. Eight, 40. That's what came from you. All right, great. That, that was interesting uh, to hear how that got started. Peter, did you always want to start? Uh, sorry, Dermot. <laughs> did you always want to start your own um, your own place, or did it just you had to solve that problem for yourself of it not existing? Um, yeah, I think uh, anyone, I suppose everyone has their own paths and all the rest of it, but you have it in you. You either know how to lead or you want to follow. And some people like the idea that they can say they know the solution. Mm. It's never thing to be the person that steps forward and puts their whole livelihood on the line to say that actually I know I can and I, I'm going to show you that I can. So I suppose I always had that built into me. Um, would I say that I would have expected uh, it to happen so quickly? Um, yeah. Could I have done it sooner in my career? For sure. Could I have just taken a nice cushy job in a big tech company for 200, 250 grand a year? For sure. Mm-hmm. Um, but I decided to go a different path and I felt it'd be great to look back um, in a couple of years' time and be proud of the work that you've done. And I think when we look back at the projects that we've done now, especially as we look back at five years in, uh, we're incredibly proud of the quality and the standards and actually how we've gone from maybe just using my role at Exit Context that would I would have built up through the networks to getting a word of mouth reputation. Uh, Wonder doesn't do advertising. Wonder doesn't do promotion. We don't enter into local awards. We only concentrate on everything looking outside of Ireland because we're in a much bigger world. And our philosophy is if you do good work, people will uh, naturally come to you. It's what I call like a lighthouse identity. So people that understand... Come, come to you and people you don't it almost acts like a filter to say okay so if you're coming to me asking me how do I get that PDF you sent me out of my browser it's in it's in the internet but <laughs> yeah you, that's usually a good filter or the person going just talk me through again how does the website work our identity kind of filters those people out. Do you get me? So, and it attracts the right level who've been there and done it. They don't need an education. We're not spending time explaining why mobile works, why social media works. Yeah. yeah? What's the importance of user research? They get it. Yeah. Gotcha. So we're at a more advanced stage with people saying, I have a much bigger question to, to solve here. I'm trying to reinvent insurance for the future, or I have a particular sales target. How do we get there? And that are the kind of questions we try and answer. Like, it's actually funny. Um, sometimes we forget. We have we have potential clients coming in and going, oh, my God, I can't believe you did that work whenever it was, and so forth. And we'd be looking at them going, oh, my God, I, we actually did that but we actually totally forgot we, we never publicize about the work that we actually do we just get it out there get it done we think about it later when it actually starts to slow down we're like take a breather but when clients come in and from word of mouth that we've actually done this work and they come to us because of the lighthouse factor um it's amazing and sometimes as Dearman says we filter out the people based on like for instance not being able to join a comms call is a big no-no for me, but unfortunately, sometimes that happens. Um, but when they come in, we we can talk to them at certain levels. So we can talk at the dev speak, we can talk at the marketing speak, we can talk at the MD speak, we can talk at the CEO speak as well. That's interesting. So, but by, by not having to, um, by having that higher barrier of entry for clients. You spend less time educating them and less money having people who can hold hands Correct. and more time creating great quality. Yes. That's, that's really interesting. Yeah. And it's not easy to get there either, uh, Dave. Like, and just to build on something, um, Pete was saying, uh, and I think I alluded to it myself, sometimes the painter's house is the last house to be painted. And anyone listening here that has their own small agency, medium or large, will always tell you that, yeah, you just never get time to look back at your own brand and craft it. <laughs> and 
a lot of the brands and agency networks that are really famous are the ones that have done that. And often you see people winning awards mm -hmm. or whatever. And you might say, actually, our work is even better, but that's because you never spent the time to give it the love it deserved to post package it. Sure. So when we work here now, we're trying to work to a model now of like, how do we close a job down? And there's almost a checklist of all the tasks that you need to do. And one of those is, okay, how do you prepare the case study? How that's going to be distributed? Who needs to read it? Why do they need to read it? If they're reading, what's the killer point that appeals to the CEO versus the head of product or the head of e-commerce? Uh, so it gets all of our guys thinking about the job job is never over. It's always ongoing. Yeah. So I, I, I assume, Dave, for yourselves, it's the same. Uh, working on your own reputation, your own brand is never easy. Oh, absolutely. It's a, um, we're never a hundred percent happy with our own website. Um, yeah. you know, cause that's it's, almost true. It's a, you know, we're just, it's, we could either spend time on the product or the website and we get so few new users directly from the website at the moment. Mm. Although if we'd spent more time, maybe we would get more, yeah. uh, but you know, making sure that that first experience in the product and the continued experience is, is as, as good as possible. That's the, the most important thing for us right now. But yeah, there's always some area where you feel bad about, I wish yeah. we could spend more time over there. Looks like, can't. looks like yeah. you need to give your website some good KPIs and see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> it's one thing that we always try to validate as well. Even before we go into discovery or inception phase of an actual product, KPIs have to be the most important thing. We have get we sometimes get some people coming in and just going, oh, I want to have this. And then you talk, them, talk to them about it. it. You end up writing things on walls and kind of going, okay, but... This has no value whatsoever, so there's no point doing it. But I still want it. Mm -hmm. But then later, after continuously talking about KPIs and making their MVPs and so forth, they end up realizing that, again, we're here to make sure that the particular product works and can actually bring back value, especially on what you're actually developing and cost. Well. And is that some of the ideas that go into the infamous phase two that we never oh, seem to get to? <laughs> Believe it or not, I've, I've even had a phase 1.b <laughs> yeah. this yep. week. And yep. um, yeah, it, it, yeah, it can happen that way. There's a story I should be telling at the moment, Dave, I go in and maybe it's not to sound cynical or old, but when you're in a business speaking meeting sometimes back in the day, someone said, that's off brand. That's mm. called for, I don't like it. Or yeah. <clears throat> I'm jealous my colleague's doing it and I'm not. Or the new oh, one. it's going to affect the SEO ranking. Absolute nonsense. Or, uh, that's how it's go. Um, I better talk to my GDPR officer. I that's better the talk new to one. my, yeah. <laughs> that'll affect GDPR. And you'd be like, okay, great. So, like, uh, phase two, GDPR, brand, yeah. We've seen it all as sure as you have, Dave. Yeah. You anything to add to that? Any differences in America? Well, that's, I've been here 11 years. So, yeah. I consider myself as more Irish than, yeah. <laughs> than American anymore. Uh, you know, it's, uh, we've had all our kids here. It's started the company here. It's, I haven't been back to the States since my eight year old was under a year. So it's been a long time. Well, <laughs> I, I was kind of impressed because just before we started this, we were talking about what do we call runners and you agreed by the end. They're not sneakers, they're runners. Yeah. 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 Or, or. Just shoes. Okay. That's all right. <laughs> like, okay. Let me ask you a question. Like with your particular products, right? Yeah. The infamous backlog. Yeah. Uh, Do you ever have things that get deleted from the backlog? Do you actually make a decision that you go, ah, oh, this is not actually not needed. It's only worth two story points. It's worth eight story points. Who cares? Right? Does it actually get removed? Do people actually realize that the backlog is not there as a bin? It's actually there for validation? Yes, we do delete some tasks from JIRA. We don't necessarily actively go back through and try to remove things, but as we get down through certain elements, it's like, mm, that doesn't make sense anymore. Let's delete mm. that. Or if we go and search for a specific thing because we're working on it mm. and... It's obviously not even it's not an element that's in the app anymore. It's time to remove that. But there's, 
I, I would not say that our process for maintaining the backlog and the sprints and the stories are necessarily optimal. Yeah. Uh, but part of that is trying to be a half PO, half scrum master, totally half you. tech lead. Yeah. Mm-mm. 80% of the ops team <laughs> on top of all that. And QA as well. As well, well yeah, as, yeah. And, and, and I, I read through pretty much every pull request mm. that comes through. So I spend so much time on that that it seems like I just kind of let the Jira work mm. slide. And I probably shouldn't. But also, we are making progress. I wonder if we might make Faster progress if, yeah. well, it's, I, PO is definitely something on the list. Someone to make sure that we're working on the right things. Um, obviously, our CEO would be a great person because she has all of the knowledge mm. of our customers and our users. Definitely. But she's mm. very busy. Doing very busy. Yeah. So there's no chance that we're going to get her to be digging through our backlog consistently. She may find a pocket of time and dig through things, but then uh, what you think is a priority today is going to change somewhat in three weeks. Well, it will continuously evolve. Yeah, and it has to. Otherwise, what are you doing? It will be stale. Yeah, yeah, Yeah. exactly. Uh, So uh, I'm always trying to create, uh, not create, but follow new processes without adding bureaucracy and it's Mm. a weird balance that I can't say that I have succeeded at so far. But that's the issue with scaling, yeah? Yeah. So you have an extremely talented um, lady in charge of your organization that knows the industry well, but she now has to be replicated. So until we've found a way to clone these people, you have to onboard new people. Onboarding new people takes many people to onboard the one person. Yes. So I often talk to people, they come to go, oh, we need to add more people. And it's never just one. You might have to add them in squads of people. Yeah. And then to your point, you have to build a process so you don't dilute your offering and the quality doesn't suffer. So anyone listening to this that has a large agency will recognize this. That as you scale, it's maintaining the quality and the intention and the truth that you've always had, tried to have in your company. Company. And that's something actually interesting and wonder. We've had that challenge and I don't mind sharing with people that maybe we've had opportunities to scale many times mm-hmm. our size and we decided not to mm-hmm. because I was worried about uh, the implications for the culture of the uh, business. And we spend a lot more time on our culture because we internalize it before we externalize it. And we're just reaching a point now where we feel our processes are much more uh, secure we at least have the self-awareness to understand that they need to be in constant flux and change to evolve them as things adapt. And we're looking forward now as we grow and expand over the next couple of months and adding additional team members, we're confident now that we're going to be growing with quality uh, and not just adding people and then wondering, exactly. are the wheels going to come off? Yeah, so maybe you recognize that mm-hmm. in your own scenario. Exactly. Yeah. Is there anything specific you do to maintain culture as you add people? Is it, is it just you keeping your eye on it or is it just in- integrating it within the rest of the team? Well, the, the truth net is, um, and if you've got founders in your business, uh, you know, they carry a lot of different um, skills that they've had to learn and carry a lot of different weight. And what happens sometimes is they almost feel like they have to have too much ownership of everything. Mm-hmm. And the trick for a business to scale is for that particular founder to let go. Yeah. And I don't mean to let go of the quality or the intention of what they're trying to deliver, but to start to trust people more and actually understand that sometimes those people might fail, mm. but they have to fail in order to grow. And people are uh, maybe founders at the moment. That's the biggest thing. Are you willing to let go and trust the other people to step up? And that's the big change that we made here in Wonder, that we decentralize control of uh, particular decision-making. And that's why people like Pete were incredibly important, or Emily or Oshin, who stepped up then to say, okay, well, I've got this. I own it. I understand the intention and the values you've set, and now I'm going to drive it on and make it better from here. And that's basically how we've done it. So it's been a much more slower process 
process for us because we've uh, done it organically by project by project and each project taking the learnings after we do the post-mortem on it to apply it to the next and evolve from there. And rather than just saying, okay, uh, let's just take those 20 extra projects and just we'll bring in a squad of people and roll with it. So a bit slower to scale, Mm -hmm. but I'm happier with the quality at which we're scaling. Does that make sense? It does. Yeah. 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 Go ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to add to that. Like, as he was saying, you can't just add one person. When you add one person, what are they going to do? They can't, the one person can't do anything. So you have to add a squadron. So I keep on going back to the agile stuff. But if you add another team, that's six people, let's just say, right? That six people then need to have projects, which means they need to have a leader on top of that, which means Daryl has to trust that leader to make sure that they can validate the project correctly to bring everything through and everything runs smoothly. Um, we do have the ethos in here that because we're all here, we're, we all talk to each other. We always have conversations. We always make sure that we can always give our information freely um, to make sure each particular project works in the exact same manner. Our methodologies have been nicely concreted now and bedded down that we, we have the trust in the people that are leading to be able to go through each particular phase of project or development cycle. And at the end, it comes out with the same model. <clears throat> so it does build on a trust factor and it does build on the actual company itself. It's funny, uh, when we, we've done, uh, you just talked about doing agency websites. For my sins, mm-hmm. I've worked on 15 agency websites in my career. And anyone that's worked on an internal agency project will know how incredibly painful those projects are, right? And one of the things that we learned with our last site, which again, we're not happy with, and people come to me and go, geez, I love your website. And I go, it's actually a bag of shit. <laughs> you think it's good? Yeah. Okay, lovely. Nice. Where wrong. do you see what's coming next? So every time you finish, you're like, it's not finished and you keep going. But we've done a lot of user testing. It's been interesting to get the feedback from clients and also get, you know, maybe positive reinforcement for some of the stuff that Pete's talking about and trust. Trust comes back a lot with uh, wonder clients and particularly I think a statement one of our key clients has penned we're almost like the anti-agency agency Mm -hmm. and that's been kind of a a nice reinforcement that the stuff that we're doing which is we're not just chasing your money we want to do good projects with you and we only do well if you do well as our clients so that's kind of how the partnership has been based on yeah Mm -hmm. so when you were talking back about adding people and how that can impact the speed at which things get done it's I remember back to when we added our first developers mm. and I'd given some some time estimates which I'm notoriously bad at which I don't think anybody's good perfect at. yeah but um, I, I I guess I'd given a time for some feature set to be developed and then we added two people because we had two different guys working with us at the time point three at a time than actually told well and Julie said, so it'll be done in a third of the time. No, no. It'll take three times longer now because of the difference in the communication. Yeah. The, the time that I would have had had to go into onboarding people. So those first tires d- will negatively impact your speed for at yeah. least a month, mm. if not longer. I'll go longer. I'll tell you when people come into wonder, um, I've seen it in other agencies having to deal with training people uh, in, and I don't mean to speak ill of the bigger network agencies because some of them are amazing, but maybe some of the lesser ones uh, might expect people to join on the Monday morning and just pick it up and go. Mm-hmm. And then they just give them five, six projects and go work it out yourself. Yeah. And if you're drowning, there's a lifeboat over there or the exit's there. Yeah. Uh, so like uh, in one of what we've tried to do is when people join they go through extensive onboarding process before they're even allowed to touch a project oh, nice. and depending on the skill base particularly UX because that's the area of interest that I, I've seen uh, anyone that comes into Wonder is made automatic to work on e-commerce projects and the reason I make people work on e-commerce projects is that there is no room for messing around in e-commerce projects if you mess up you're fired like uh, whereas maybe some of the corporate clients you can just make a big brochure where website and it doesn't matter does it work or it doesn't work with e-commerce you got to show results so get people working on projects because they learn the basics and i often say to 
clients maybe in insurance or energy or stuff that a lot of them are still playing catch up with stuff we've been doing in e-commerce for over a decade now and uh, a lot of the stuff that we end up doing that they consider advancements are just the basics of what we do in e-commerce so that's why we try and UX particularly get people into those areas to kind of make it more hard nose that they understand that extreme yeah oh, nice. and on the other side then when they join we tend to give them then what we call uh, la da web which mm. is my word for creating beautiful web experiences oh. right because in a lot of uh, agencies they might have pressure just to keep those projects coming and churning we're here one day we try to get one or two signature projects a year that we can be proud of that get submitted to A awards FWA CSS design awards all those platforms that inspire us so that we're contributing and giving some back mm. to the community so you probably would have seen this year uh, Dave we worked on the website of the year awards in collaboration with the CSS design awards, which is kind of a, a global portal for the best in class web work oh, okay. reviewed yeah. by designers themselves. Yeah. Okay. And to get on that jury, you have to actually have one. So it's the standard is fairly high, the same way with awards and FWA and uh, third be enjoyable project. So if anyone's have a look at it, if you go to CSS design awards and go to Warty uh, 2018, you'll get to see an example of what I mean by just creating something beautiful that again, tries to make the internet more of a fun place. Cause nice. it'd be very easy to be uh, not so fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like Twitter. Yeah. <laughs> no doubt. That's why I haven't been on Facebook in two yeah. months. Now. Yeah. Two months. That's, about oh, five years from here, I think. Well, we're, we're of a Bebo generation. Oh, we've been around, yeah, uh, Bebo. <laughs> yeah, just we've been, bought, just yeah. bought that. It's, it's well, back. It's, uh, so many of the people, you know, from my youth and family are Mm-mm. way back in the States. So Facebook was the way I was able to keep mm. up with them, but it just got to be where it wasn't even worth that. So yeah, we, we'll see what happens with the political climate over the next few months, years, whatever. Uh, yeah, I, I think it's a, uh, is a good man there. The book that I was describing with Gary uh, V, as they all say. I mean, I, I do like a particular statement. He always says that it's very easy to be negative. And actually, the more people that can be more upbeat and positive about what's happening can hopefully one day counterbalance the other extreme. <laughs> so obviously, like, it's very interesting when people come to apply for jobs and wonders. The first thing I check, I check their social profiles. Mm-hmm. Are you tweeting anything crazy about something? Because if you are, that doesn't show much restraint to me. Yeah. Uh, and I'd rather uh, people that are uh, focusing on passion and interest, uh, the same way as like, if I speak about myself, if you see what I'm tweeting about, it's always about technology, particularly at the moment, facial recognition technology that's breaking Japan. Mm. Uh, it's just absolutely amazing and how wow. insane it is. And again, like that's the stuff that I'm into. Mm-hmm. And at least it's not just ranting about something that happened on some TV show like and Love Island. Not or, yeah, or making an opinion or a statement about people. It's just, uh, I think there's a lot in what Gary V says. And in his own right, he probably gets a backlash now because he's a guy trying to, yeah. uh, you know, change the way people think about stuff. But uh, for me, I find him uh, very interesting, uh, very inspiring guy. So, uh, Peter, the KPIs you were talking about mm. before, I, I'm sure there are definitely specifics for each instance, but are there any um, common ones that you you often have to introduce to clients? Well, like usually, I know it sounds extremely strange, but usually clients don't come in with actual targets or anything got to do with the actual product itself, or let's just say in this case website. Um, we end up having to sit them down to go, right, so how many people do you actually need to get to make this product valid? And they're like, I don't know, how much money do I have to spend, spend to make it into a product? And then it kind of works around that way. Mm-hmm. Sometimes because we know so much about the funneling system of e-commerce, we can straight out of the park say what your targets should be. And we often put ourselves on the line saying that, but we do validate it in the end because we're, we're always true to our truths. That's with the clarity and the bravery part to it. Um, so sometimes it could be, right, you want 14% uh, conversion rate. Grant, we'll give you that. Make it as a target, but make sure that everything that you're trying to do for your first MVP yeah. is coherent to that particular KPI. Mm-hmm. We've had an interesting one where a KPI came in where it could save 20 million for someone. 
And that's a massive KPI mm. that they didn't even think about yeah. until they could see it written down and they realized it. And it's like, okay, we have to do this <clears throat> straight away. Everything gets validated because of that particular KPI. Yes. So it, it can make or break an actual project. So like, the, just to give more context to what Pete's saying is that sometimes clients, they're so busy, uh, stuck in meetings all day. In fairness, like a lot of our clients, no time to do the work, plenty of time for meetings, no time to do the work from the meetings. So it's a vicious cycle. And as Pete says, that come in sometimes to help write that business case and you help them see the wood from the trees. And that's where we spend most of the time at the start, trying to work that out before we go anywhere near sketching or getting into any sort of prototyping or concepting or whatever. Uh, it's an incredibly important phase because it helps set the focus and it moves it from the subjective sometimes into a uh, more targeted uh, approach. And again, it allows us to kind of... Uh, fl- swat away any of the silly emotional stuff that might come on projects sometimes with people because you're always bringing it back to what KPI was set. Yeah, that, that's, make- that is one thing that I will always say. There's always emotions tied in to the start of a project, especially with people who come in and say that they're the product owner of their mm-hmm. project, but they're not actually an owner of anything. They're yeah. just there for a particular reason. So they're a stakeholder. Gotcha. And the emotions can be tied down to those <clears throat> particular projects. So when you do actually validate a KPI, it becomes targeted. It becomes more of a business sense. Trying to take away the emotion from the business is one of the key factors for that particular, I would like to call it an accelerator, but <laughs> I don't know what way people like uh, to call uh, it. Never word, diplomacy through design. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, so look, uh, with uh, everything, uh, I suppose, uh, that helps Pete uh, as well sometimes in the projects is we do a lot of user testing. Um, particularly anyone that's a UX designer understand what we do. Sometimes in clients' budget, the first thing they want to cut is user testing. Uh, or they want to scale back and go, should I got this, or should I spoke to my aunt, or Johnny down the road is great, and should he'll just test it for me. And uh, it's amazing how many times we'll, even if that client has cut the budget on us, we'll do the user testing ourselves anyway in order to help uh, with Validate. the project. And again, that comes back to, because we're a smaller business, we'll make them choices because it's in the interest of everybody in the end that we do it. Yeah. And it doesn't necessarily mean we get paid one iota for it, but basically it makes us and gives us the confidence that yes, this works. And sure, look, as you know yourself, 89% of the time you're doing user testing in the UX, it's copy amends. And some people try to UX copy amends when it can just be written. So like uh, anyone that's been through that world might recognize what I'm talking about there. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, so as Pete says, setting the business case, but also not being frightened to push actual real users feedback as the way to go. Yeah. That is one thing I would say, yeah. Um, separating the u- user testing of UX versus the marketing talk or the name of a product yeah. Yeah. is key as well. Mm-hmm. So you can always validate user testing and make sure that the funnel and the KPI will be met. But if your product is totally wrong in the first place from a marketing perspective, it'll fail. Mm-hmm. And we have to kind of separate those two things as well. So we do have testing on both sectors. Mm-hmm. How many of the projects that you work on are more waterfall where you know what's going to be involved beforehand and how many are where you can actually use some value judgments on? So currently at, at the moment, it's about 70-30. So um, 70 in the agile speak. <coughs> um, sometimes we have to work in agile going from UX, UI, dev all together. Sometimes we have to do UX and UI together and then go into dev, which is kind of like a waterfall. And then sometimes we have to teardrop, which Mm. is a kind of a term I've kind of put together (laughs) where we have to do like maybe two or three days within their sprint to fit their model. So we're, I hate using the word agile, but we're very flexible Mm -hmm. in which way we can work for any particular client. Um, Because again, we're not intrusive we're not trying to change their processes. We're trying to t- think in a way to make them a little bit more educated on what they're actually doing from a UX, UI, product-led environment. But we're not trying to change their internal processes. Okay? So, again, sometimes 
clients will go, oh, we have our own internal dev team, but yeah. we want you to do the front-end development. We'll go, okay, we'll change our model and fit that particular model. That's fine, just as long as we can all come to an agreement of how the delivery will be given and so forth, and we work with that. Yeah, I suppose, David, like uh, you have seen it, especially in pharma sectors maybe, but uh, a lot of internal teams sometimes come to us because when we're doing digital projects, it's not actually about the project, it's about HR and human issues. Yeah. So a lot of times, particularly digital transformation, this word that's a buzzword at the moment, really it's all about people management and the end output of platforms or websites or apps or whatever it is the agency partner does. That's just the afterthought, really. Uh, I think the, the, the role of uh, fixing how people work internally sometimes is our biggest challenge, uh, making sure that we have corresponding skill sets that can really interface with, which I'm sure you recognize yeah. with. And I think in everything with Agile, as much as we love its uh, methodology, and maybe it would be safe to say, Pete, that we borrow bits from there, borrowed borrowed bits, yeah. bits from design thinking, design sprint, all of them, mashed them up, and that's how we've evolved. But uh, how many businesses out there can really say that they say they're doing Agile, but sometimes it's just an excuse for they never written anything down in, in the first place, mm -hmm. and they've just ended up somewhere, but, yeah. but now they're working Agile. Yeah. yeah. Or sometimes they've gone agile, but uh, they actually don't know where the finish point is or where they are. So, like, uh, I think there's a lot of uh, things yet to be ironed out with agile. I'm sure we'll be hit with the next wave of terminology as mm. to what it is we're doing next and what when's it due next year. God only knows. Uh, yeah, let's be honest. Yeah. Well, it's, I mean, that's, as a CTO, I find that to be the hardest part of everything. Yeah. Actually, solving technical issues it takes some time and some intellect. You can get there, though. But you can always get there. But fixing the process is just, it's yeah. its something I can't, it I can't to seem built. to make work right. It has to be built for your own company. Yeah. It has to, because it's always changing. Mm -hmm. Like, again, if you expand and you have to get another team in, you have to change your model again, because yeah. you're yeah. going to end up having... Yeah two grooming sessions, three grooming sessions, a BAU team and all this kind of stuff. Yeah. It has to evolve to fit your own particular product. You know, regardless of your teams and your skill sets, it, it always has to be your own custom variant of it. And, and then if you think about, um, if you take a two-week sprint, yeah, how many two weeks look like the previous two weeks with, yeah. did somebody get sick? Did somebody go mm. on holidays? Yeah. Did somebody get pulled into a meeting they weren't expecting? The, you have so much, uh, I've lost the word, uh, variance. Variance, yeah, yeah. The, just stuff that you don't know what's unpredictability. That was what I was yeah. looking for. Because, like, I, I always try on the second Wednesday of every sprint is my cool down. I always try to have my cool down on the Wednesday. Was it never happens that way. There's always some kind of QA that needs to be fixed or something has to come in to make sure it works or the user acceptance yeah. test hasn't been passed and it expands out into Thursday and sometimes into Friday morning and yeah. you're like, oh God, we're not going to finish. But yeah. you have to, it, it has to change. It does. What, uh, in term it, when you started, obviously there's a, a period where things go well, things go not so well. Has it stabilized? And if so, when when did that happen? Uh, yeah. Uh, you, you mean in terms of Wonder as a business? Yeah. Uh, so I suppose Wonder was is privately financed. So when we started Wonder, we were offered different mechanisms. Maybe people uh, wanted Wonder to be part of their group environment. You know, uh, and the people want to just be silent investors, as they say. And I suppose when I was starting Wonder, uh, one of the first things is I went to speak to many men and women who've been there before because you think you're special and you're new or you're doing it different, you're not. This has been done before. It was just a different technology and a different level of spiel. So I ended up talking to a lot of people that have been in the brand world and in architecture because they had gone through similar experiences where some of them business had scaled up to be quite large and then break back into specialisms. And if you will, Wonder is more like a niche boutique offering than it ever will be a, a mass, will do anything for your money type of thing. So 
First couple of years, uh, we never borrowed a penny, uh, never had an overdraft, uh, have always made a profit. And the reason why we've done that is always by not scaling too fast that you end up with pressure points that you end up then having to take projects that aren't true and, uh, true to the spirit of what you're trying to achieve. And then that, if you do that, you can get into a vicious cycle and then you end up like everywhere else. So yeah. in short, how long did it take? Um, I would say the first two years was to get to a particular point where we added a number of extra employees. Uh, for anyone that's out there, that's maybe four or five years in the Fifth year tends to be that tipping point where all the hard work, those 300 hour months that you've been doing for three or four years, start to pay dividends where um, you have such a, a bank of work and there's so much organic conversation happening around you that phone calls are now starting to ring. Mm-hmm. So now I've got not just one bank, two banks ringing me uh, looking for the same project. How did they find out about me? Never sure. I don't do promotion, don't do anything, but it's just organically happening. So I'd say now we're starting to feel the, some of the benefits mm. of the first couple of years. Yeah. What, what would you have done different if you had the opportunity to go back in time? Uh, the thing that uh, even in the advisory board meeting that I had on Friday, that was number one topic. Uh, I would spend even more time on internal culture. I spent a, a massive amount of time on that. Uh, regardless of the space that we've been in. I've always invested in trying to make the environment for people comfortable or at least seem uh, something a bit different. Uh, mm. Some of us have been in places where the reception looks nice. You get past reception. <laughs> and then there's just the heart of us with the headphones on working, yeah? Shoulder to shoulder. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> here we've tried to create an environment uh, that feels like a nice space to work in, is in a good location. You can just walk out, mm. get coffee, go for noodles to whatever the interest you in or even do shopping like mm-hmm. Pete does every Friday. Shopping is <laughs> rare course, or Pete's course. Fridays. <laughs> uh, the other thing that I would have done more of uh, and the thing that I think I've probably said too many times already is invested even more in our brand. Mm-hmm. So I would have gone um, uh, at the start even harder on some of the things around how we package our story and our philosophy. Mm-hmm. And I'm only ramping that back up now. Um, but I would have probably not uh, eased off the gas, so to speak, on that work, whereas you kind of get pulled back into the engine, you're working on UX flows, you're in meetings, you're working with Pete and stuff, and you forget that stuff. So that's the two areas. So I would have done even more on internal culture, and I probably would have kept the pedal on full speed on my own uh, brand promotion of wonder. Does that? Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. that makes sense. Peter, what um, what sorts of things have you learned? Like, what's the biggest thing you've learned as a director of product that you didn't realize beforehand? It's taken a personal out. It's not me. I'm not me. As let's just say, I have to be each individual product, and I have to be not human, if you want to put it in that sense. I've so I've spent a lot of time coming to the factor that, okay, I'm going to be this particular product, and that's it. Mm-hmm. I have to make sure that I'm perfect, not make sure that I'm perfect for me. Mm-hmm. I'm perfect exactly. for the product, and I have to fit that. Um, then mm-hmm. the next part after that, like you were saying, with your estimates and so forth, Oh, it'd be 10 times faster for me to do it, mm. right, personally. but You can only do one of those. I can only do one of those. If I've got eight projects, uh, products currently ongoing across many sectors, I can't give a whole day stuck in development cycles or talking to UX people about that particular product because I have to separate myself two hours for each project and just work it that way. Mm. So that's that's what took the longest time for me. Yeah. Two very different answers there, Dave. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, what's next for Wonder? I mean, now you've said you've said a bit about expanding the um, the brand, um, but anything other than that? Or yeah. Um, where are we at the moment? We have taken a lot of new interesting clients. Um, 
some uh, more international, like our first couple of years, uh, actually, ironically, 90% of our business was based in San Francisco, working with tech companies. <laughs> uh, and then the more that we got started, the more it became Irish companies and less and less. So at the moment, we have about 30% UK, about 10, 15 Netherlands, the rest is Ireland, and America's kind of fallen away. So it'd be great uh, with some of the new projects that we're starting to kind of change those percentages again. So we're going to have a lot more international work, which is great. The other thing is we are adding more team members. So um, I'm not just trying to plug it. I am actually... Uh, <laughs> feel free, feel free. Like uh, the types of people that work in Wonder... Uh, aren't just pure developers or pure UX. No. They've lived many lives and understand what bits they want to focus on. Mm. And particularly people who have uh, maybe you're Irish and you've worked abroad and you want to come home, uh, that tends to be a, a typical demographic that comes to wonder because a lot of the ways we work might be similar to what they've experienced working in New York or San Fran or London or um, Tokyo, wherever different people have, have come from. So I think... Uh, the next steps are we're adding team members and we're going to be concentrating on embedding them and making them feel like the family unit that we've got mm-hmm. here and then bringing in the clients to, um, to kind of uh, scale up what we're doing. So there's quite a number of large projects coming in. That means uh, we will, again, as I said to all employees, be an ever uh, comp- type of... Uh, I would say it'll be very different in six months' time again because things are going to have uh, added a bit more. But this time we're scaling with confidence in our methodology, system, people, exactly. culture. Yeah, so. But, uh, you, I'm sure you've touched on this in the other things that you've said, but what's the biggest problem that you've currently got? The biggest problem? Yeah. In Ireland? Well, just, just wonder. The, yeah, yeah, inter- yeah, like, well, uh, rather than going into maybe my own area of UX, that I could probably go on a rant for about problems yeah. there. But uh, I suppose the area in Ireland that we have is the, um, talent, and um, this market is full of uh, digital wannabes, as I call them, that, you know, think because they can hack stuff together on social that they're a consultant. And I think... Uh, Particularly UX area, there's a lot of people that are failed UI designers that now pretend they're UX designers. Mm. Mm. You've got lots of people calling themselves UX designers and think they know how to do research well, but like sit them in a room with a proper planner or strategic person and they start to realize, actually, my little persona map, so am I happy or sad isn't enough. Uh, there's much more to this. And obviously, you know, I'm sure someone's going to pick up and then go, well, actually, you know, the, I have a different view. Great. No problem. Uh, bring it on and talk to me about it. But I think uh, one of the areas in Ireland is talent. Uh, and with every agency, studio, practice, whatever you call it, uh, getting the right type of talent is the biggest challenge at the moment because there just isn't the colleges here like we have in Paris. You know, a lot of the staff that come and join Wonder have come from Heatech or these places that are churning out generation after generation of excellent talent. And I think Ireland certainly has uh, some way to go yet as to revamping how the universities and colleges are preparing people for industry and having the right type of courses uh, that connect with business. Um, I've reached out to so many of the colleges and it's amazing how incredibly poor and amateurish they are at uh, even linking up with us, I've offered people paid internships to get them started the same way I was, that you could work on real projects. Nothing beats that. And it's incredibly hard to even get anything with those. So, really? so talent is definitely the big thing. And with the arrival of all the bigger tech companies, uh, who can throw an extra 50 or 60 grand on top of the salary you can offer, mm. all that together, that's for me at the moment the issue. So, I look abroad now for talent and bringing them to Ireland in a housing crisis. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and so I have to work very hard outside of normal HR procedures to help them find houses to live if they're bringing a family, you know, pay for them in hotels and all the rest of it. So they're the kind of yeah. maybe challenge that I see is uh, that, uh, <coughs> and also having enough businesses willing to share like what you're trying to do here, Dave, with this, uh, podcast is great you know sharing those insights and not being frightened to sit behind the wall in case you give away any secrets oh, yeah, yeah. you know we're completely open so i'd be more than happy to meet other founders and come together to help 
uh, encourage the next generation of people to join the, the sector. So if anyone's listening, get in touch. We yeah, can do it. That's great. Yeah, because, I mean, just because you tell somebody how you do something doesn't mean that they've got the chutzpah to, yeah. <laughs> to actually do it. Yeah. Uh, for, from the product side, what do you think the biggest challenge currently that you're facing? It is the exact same thing. Is I'm it? sorry, but... I have many people coming up to me going, oh, they have their Scrum Master qualified and their CPOs and they have everything certified, but they've never worked in the sector. They've never, I, I think it's extremely easy to go off and get a cert nowadays. Um, but a Scrum Master, if it's a Scrum Master in a dev cycle, has to come from a dev cycle. Yeah. They have to understand. Yeah. And if they don't, there's no point having somebody there if they're not, technically orientated in the first place to fit into a technically orientated role. Same thing with product owners. I always believe that a product owner should be somebody within your company who has an extinct understanding for what they're trying to reach. Basically, the company. They mm -hmm. need to understand the company and who they're trying to target. Yeah. <clears throat> it's very hard to find those type of people currently at the moment. And it's becoming increasingly difficult because... The market has now all changed to be product-led yeah. and agile-led, exclamation mark. Um, but they're not trained to do the actual work. Yeah, everyone's a product manager, but they've never actually coded anything ever in their lives. Mm. And one of the interesting things is I get people approach me for those roles. And if I hear they've never actually been a developer or done or been in the engine room themselves, I always wonder, really... You know, it makes me a bit more skeptical. So I think just to build on what Pete's saying, I think a lot of people want to be at the star level without having put in the work. And I think uh, patience and perseverance and not being frightened to take, uh, as we did, uh, work for free or less money yeah. uh, and put in the graph, get the experience and build up. It's too easy in this town at the moment just to jump. 10 grand salaries by moving from different brands which yeah. we see a lot yeah. but again maybe that's always been the case mm. and this is just a cycle and that's how it works and we just need to get on with it yeah. Yeah. so that's fine we'll, well, we'll get on with it I'll put a note on that right I think nowadays people are jumping to get that extra 10 grand but they're not actually thinking about their future like okay you can jump in your 20s all the way up until you're 32 for 10 grand every year but after that, you're going to be on such a high scale, mm. you're going to be let go because obviously you're not doing any the particular work and you won't be able to find a job on that scale again. Mm. You have to upskill yourself smartly yeah. to be able to fulfill what you're actually trying to do. Would you say, Dave, did any truth in the stuff we're saying there? Or yeah, did I you recognize it? Definitely. Well, the housing crisis is yeah. the <laughs> biggest problem, which leads to all the other problems yes like I, talent I, yeah i didn't realize the level of the educational problem but like just for from pure dev stuff that there's people who just can't afford to be here yeah so they leave mm. and um so that makes it it makes everything harder you have to pay everyone more so that they can live and nobody's, you know getting rich in 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 the first few years of a startup so yeah having the resources to bring in enough people to do all the things when it's so ridiculously expensive to live here. It's a, I don't have the exact number in front of me, but I heard that Ireland's like one of the, like the 10th mm. most expensive country in the world. Yeah. It would be uh, something like that. I'm, I'm sure Dublin's either number one, two, three or four or five of cities. So we may be in a good spot. But all these large tech companies coming in mm -hmm. are increasing the costs. You've got the number of people that are controlling the government who are already landlords, which does not help the issue because they, they have – it's against their interests to solve that problem. Yes. Correct. So I've, that's the biggest thing. And then timings, <laughs> figuring yeah. out how to move faster. That, yeah. that's the the things that I find are the biggest issues but the uh, what you were saying about the uh, product owners who haven't written code or uh, scrum masters who haven't worked in a tech team mm. just like with starting a company you may theoretically know how hard it is or what's involved 
But just like that quote from Mike Tyson, everybody's got a plan until they get punched in the face. I had no idea how hard it was. Yeah. Even knowing it was going to be hard. But you're putting it on the line. Yeah. It's, it's your it's face so that's going to get punched. Yeah. Over yeah. and over exactly. and over. It's funny, Dave, uh, i tell you silly. So I've been meeting, uh, I always meet just different people that have deliberately different backgrounds, just so I can mix it up and challenge the way you're thinking. And I was um, meeting a gentleman recently, we were talking about this very topic, and uh, he was saying, you know, like, how hard was it at the start? And I said, I was doing 250 to 300 hours a month, guaranteed. Like, that's what it took to, to scale a quality. Quality didn't just come, like, anyone that's worked on a beautiful website knows you put in many, 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 many more hours than it takes or paid for to do it. And, uh... Yeah, so anyone listening out there, there's no quick road, there's no easy money, there's no uh, thing, but it can be fun uh, as long as you're into it. So you came at the start, and I think we're nearly at the end now, and you said, you know, if we had advice for people out there, what it would be was uh, be patient, uh, don't worry about uh, the money. If you're good enough, the money will sort itself out in the end. Uh, just concentrate on your craft and stick to your niche. There's too many people that are digital. Everything's yeah. be a digital something, <clears throat> be something special and be good at it and mm-hmm. concentrate on there and the rest will work itself yeah. out. And that is, so even though I've said, and I've said before how hard it is, I wouldn't trade it. It's exactly. absolutely yeah. worth every moment of pain because I've grown so much from it. So and it's something you love. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, Hopefully there's a reward coming in there <laughs> yeah, sometime soon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, is there anything else? No, that's, really that's it. Hey, well, look, thanks for coming to Wonder. Oh, thank you so much for joining me. And uh, any call to action for the listeners or just? Well, look, uh, yeah, I mean, if you, if you want to be uh, talk to us more about any of the topics, you can just reach out to us on Twitter. Uh, you know how it works. Yeah, yeah, you know our name, Wonder. Yeah, W O N D R dot I O dot O. Yeah, you just reach out to us, and if you're particularly interested, maybe you've got a particular digital niche that you're good at, get in touch. You never know. If you don't ask, you don't get. Exactly. Yeah. We're always open to meet new people. Yeah, talking work, talking business, awesome. even having a pint. We don't. <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah. That's awesome. right. Well, thank you so much, and thank you all for listening. Until next time, remember, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic.